Hello, everyone. My name is Jeffrey Shu. I'm from Leahy Health and Medical Center, and I'll be talking to you about communicating the radiation risk of CT imaging. I have no disclosures to make. So this talk uh, was born out of a paper that Aaron Sodickson and I wrote back in 2016 about communicating radiation risk to patients and providers in the ED setting. So this is intended to be sort of a broader offshoot of that. The first part of my talk is structured around these three questions. Why should we discuss? Meaning, what's the background evidence? What's the knowledge base of providers? And what do patients want? After we cover that, we'll talk about who should discuss, meaning should it be the radiologist? Should it be the referring provider? Should it be the CT technologist? And then we'll go into how to discuss. This is the section about communication strategies, how to make the radiation risk from medical imaging more relatable to patients, more understandable. And then we'll talk about two specialized topics that are also related, of course, to the subject matter, the question of whether we ought to be doing full informed consent for CT, and what about cumulative exposure, the patients who have had numerous CT studies over the years and therefore who have accumulated significant uh, cancer risk from all those studies. Let's start with the background and challenges. So this audience, I'm sure, knows that CT usage over the last few decades has grown considerably. Um, of course, uh, COVID dropped things for artificial reasons, but uh, we've seen a significant rebound even in recent times after COVID. Not that COVID is over. Um, it's been pretty well established that cancer risk is higher in younger patients and that body imaging, uh, CTs of the abdomen and pelvis, CT of the spine, especially deliver significant amounts of dose. I'll just cite one paper as an example. Um, for instance, in JAMA, it was found that in girls, one radiation-induced solid cancer would develop in every three to 400 abdomen and pelvis CTs. He had roughly similar ratios for uh, girls who had chest CTs or spine CTs. Uh, when it came to leukemia from head CTs in children under five, the estimated rate was approximately one in 5,000. And these are not small numbers. Each year, 4 million pediatric CTs of the head, abdomen, and pelvis, chest, or spine are performed. And that projects to about nearly 5,000 future cancers. It would be great if we could provide very refined risk estimates to patients, but we unfortunately can't quite do that. We have to have these rough numbers the data and risk models that have been developed apply to populations, not individual patients. Uh, as it's been found, cancer risk does vary considerably by age and gender. However, tools like effective dose, uh, it averages out these important uh, differences. And so we're left with rough ballpark estimates. Patients and providers, uh, Let's talk about them. Patients, it's been found, are generally not very familiar with the radiation risk from CT. They have expressed a desire to be informed about these risks, but they are often not told. In surveys, providers also wish to inform patients. However, they may not feel comfortable discussing them. They also may not be familiar with the doses from the CT studies, especially the CT studies that are at the local institution, the doses may be considerably lower than what uh, is generally reported in the literature. 
Also, they may not be able to fully feel comfortable connecting the imaging to cancer risk. Medical students have uh, expressed lack of confidence about their knowledge of the subject. Few discuss radiation risk with their patients. In a survey of radiology residents, their understanding uh, was also found to be limited, uh, such as the lifetime risk of cancer mortality in children. Well, that's not to say that all providers are uh, feeling inadequate about this a survey. On the other hand, of ED residency program directors found that over four-fifths of them discuss radiation risk from medical imaging almost always or most of the time for patients under 18. This, uh, they did this less often with older patients. Uh, nonetheless, they felt at least a little over 50% felt very or extremely comfortable discussing risk with patients. And that's good because patients asked about radiation risk quite often. So I propose that based on what I've shown so far, we have a responsibility to inform patients they want to know. And the best data points towards a small but non-negligible risk. So that was the why portion of our talk. Now it's the who portion. So who should talk? Should it be the referring provider, the one who orders the study? Should it be the radiologist, the one who has had more dedicated training and uh, theoretically knowledge about uh, CT dose and cancer risk? Should it be the CT technologist who is the forward-facing person in imaging typically, who prepares the patient for the study, tells them what to expect, so on and so forth. There are advantages and disadvantages to any of these, I think. The referring provider typically would have the more substantive relationship with the patient. They would be the point person for answering questions generally about clinical care. They understand better why they think a CT is needed. And however, they may not necessarily have had much or any education about uh, radiation dose and uh, the linkage to cancer. Radiologists are more likely to have had dedicated training on how to provide an estimate of the cancer risk. It's a uh, part of uh, training for the boards, for example. Um, I think one of the challenges, though, is the radiologist may not be available, especially, I think, in outpatient imaging contexts. And with teleradiology becoming, I think, certainly a bigger thing post-COVID, this will make it even more challenging. Again, the technologist is uh, typically the forward-facing person in radiology, but for various reasons, I think uh, they're often not empowered to discuss uh, certain topics with patients. So among these three choices, who should speak? I would say that generally it's probably best that the referring provider discuss this with the patient. Um, if we decide on that, then broader education for referring providers is critical. Uh, the radiologists and technologists should be available to answer specific questions the referring provider cannot answer. And I think in a, any healthcare system, having clear roles is important. Uh, it should be fairly clear who is the person who would do this and do that. Also, I think we should try to refine what is meant when someone asks about why they're getting a CT. I think if the question is, well, what benefit is the CT going to uh, give for 
me, then I think uh, the referring provider should answer that question. They're the ones who are thinking that the patient might have a pulmonary embolism or aortic dissection or appendicitis, and um, they can speak more to, I think, uh, why CT is needed uh, for them to diagnose it. And also the risk of not getting a CT, the risk of not being able to make a diagnosis in a timely manner. If it's about the risk of CT, specifically the cancer risk, then I think as a start, the referring provider, again, is probably the best person. They're already talking to the patient. They can put it in context with the benefits of getting the CT. But again, the radiologist and I would say the technologist should be available to help in these discussions. Now let's get into communication strategies or the how portion of our talk. I think this does not need to be said, but I think we should just put it out there. Um, of course, it's obvious uh, that we should be introducing ourselves to patient appropriately, respecting uh, their uh, identities, how they identify themselves, express empathy to the patients and their designated healthcare decision makers. You want to speak concisely, you want to translate terms into understandable concepts, avoid medical jargon, and you want to give patients opportunities to ask questions. You really want to make sure that they, as best as they can, uh, understand. So what are some of these strategies to help patients understand? One strategy uh, is to compare the radiation from an imaging study to the radiation from the ambient environment. Uh, people know they're living in the world and uh, although they may not necessarily know that they're getting radiation constantly, uh, it does put it into perspective that, well, you know, we're all getting some radiation. Um, it may be different depending on, you know, what elevation you live in and so on, but we're all getting some radiation. So a common phrase, at least for chest x-rays, is, Chest X-ray provides about as much radiation as a transcontinental U.S. flight. You can do the same with CT. Typically, that's compared with the average annual background dose from cosmic radiation. And, um, however, uh, this comparison is not without problems. First of all, it may lead a patient to inadvertently think that background radiation is safe. It is not safe. It's part of life, but it's just being around background radiation elevates your cancer risk. Also, you're comparing one abstract exposure to another, and it doesn't necessarily link uh, things to the magnitude of the risk. So there's another strategy, which is to compare to other activities of life, uh, activities that many people do, most people do, um, and patients at least may have some intuitive sense of the risk involved in those activities. So frequent uh, areas, uh, frequent things that people compare with are uh, activities like smoking or driving a car, or chest x-ray, you know, it's equivalent to about smoking nine cigarettes or 23 miles of driving on a highway, or chest CT, and this is just using numbers, uh, uh, dose from uh, radiology info uh, website, and just multiplying it. So chest CT would uh, be equivalent to about 550 cigarettes or 1,400 miles of highway driving. A third strategy would be to compare it to the overall likelihood of getting cancer in one's life. Uh, when you put it into this perspective, then the added cancer risk from medical imaging is quite small. Um, 
that's because the risk of getting cancer in your life is rather high, 40% or more. And this, you know, patients may have not realized that the overall cancer risk uh, was so high. So uh, this may alarm the patient inadvertently. So here's a table uh, taken from uh, the paper that Aaron Sodickson and I wrote, um, comparing these strategies and uh, listing some advantages and disadvantages if you look from left to right. So again, if you compare radiation exposure from an imaging study to ambient environmental exposure, it does communicate the fact that radiation exposure is part of everyone's life. It may inadvertently imply that ambient radiation is safe, and that's not what we want people to think. Also, it does not make a direct link from exposure to cancer risk. When you compare risk from imaging to activities like smoking or driving a car, people may have a better intuitive understanding the risks of those activities. However, latency is important. The time it takes from the activity to the mortality event differs considerably for different activities. People's risk stance with driving, knowing that an accident could result in immediate serious harm or death, uh, they may take a different approach than, let's say, smoking or drinking alcohol, uh, the effects of which may not present for years or decades. Finally, you can compare cancer risk from one imaging study with the overall cancer risk in one's lifetime. This puts into perspective that imaging, uh, CT imaging specifically here, uh, is uh, the incremental risk of it is very small compared to the overall risk of getting cancer. However, again, this may cause anxiety. Patients may have not known that the baseline risk for getting cancer was so high, even though they uh, many people do survive uh, the cancer that they get. It's also critical that we express to patients that we're doing our best. Uh, we want to try to reassure patients that uh, I imagine like many institutions and Aaron Sodickson has done this at the Brigham, uh, implementing uh, CT protocols with a much less uh, dose uh, than the literature estimates typically presented. Um, you want to convey that the goal is to image in a judicious evidence-based manner. And also if they're getting an MRI or ultrasound, patients may not realize that these do not produce uh, ionizing radiation and therefore uh, there's no cancer risk from that. And else can be quite effective, uh, can put things into terms easy to understand. Uh, you can have handouts in the patient's native language. Uh, this, uh, if you go on image generally, for example, there are a number of handouts in different languages. Um, and also, you know, if it's like a local uh, institution specific handout, you can also explain things like how we've been able to reduce uh, the dose of the uh, pediatric head CTs, for example. Some places have a consultative service uh, where radiologists can discuss findings and recommendations directly with patients. Uh, typically, it's used for imaging results, but I think it also could be another opportunity to discuss radiation risk with patients. There are many great online resources. I've just listed three here with information uh, that uh, can be easily accessed and given to patients. So that was communication strategies. And now I'd like to jump to the topic of informed consent. Generally speaking, ethical standards argue that we ought to disclose any and all significant potential harms that may result. 
This is so that patients and providers can come to a truly informed healthcare decision. The underlying ethical principles here include patient autonomy, patient protection, and trust. And this is so that patients can make a fully voluntary independent decision. Um, all these decisions about uh, procedures and diagnostics uh, should be with the patient's preferences in mind. If we were to do informed consent for CT to discussion, and generally discussion, uh, even if we didn't have a full consent form signed, so on, um, should provide an understanding of the imaging risks of CT, not just the radiation risk, but potentially other risks, um, as well as potential benefits such as timely and accurate diagnosis, as well as the limitations. Uh, there may be better tests to diagnose, uh, for instance, obviously breast cancer than CT. Um, this is so that we can aim towards a shared decision-making process between the patient and the provider. Now, I think in general, consent is not done often in CT. Perhaps maybe there are some special cases uh, where uh, a patient has a known significant contrast allergy that needs a study uh, in a more expedited fashion than would be uh, doable with the typical uh, pre-medication uh, regimes. Um, they also do consent, I think, uh, at least some places, I'm sure. Um, Brigham, I know that they, this is done. Uh, for instance, for pregnant patients uh, who are getting an MRI, a radiologist would consent them, uh, basically telling them, uh, you know, we don't think there's any risk, but we don't know for sure. So generally it's not done. Full informed consent is generally not done for CT radiation risk, but should it be? It's been argued uh, by Ben Harvey and others that no, we shouldn't do it. Uh, the arguments are that the risks are not well established or not established enough. Also that they may not necessarily meet the threshold of uh, significant harm that uh, warrants informed consent. Uh, seen that others have argued otherwise, uh, arguing that the risks are well established and do meet the threshold. People like Jim Brink have argued that instead of informed consent, we ought to do informed decision making. Uh, the, this is more emphasized, uh, emphasizing broad education of patients uh, through things like handouts and these communication strategies, talking with the patients about it rather than having uh, be about some legal obligation. I, I want to get into these arguments a bit. Um, I think uh, it's not quite true to say that informed consent, uh, you shouldn't need to do informed consent if we don't know uh, the risk. Uh, part of consent is also saying that things we don't know. Um, it may be that there is some risk, but we don't know. We have to tell the patient, or at least we ought to. You know, perhaps the uh, data for cancer risk from uh, CT imaging is not perfect. I think uh, a lot of us would agree with that, but uh, to the best of our knowledge, this is what we can say. And just remember that signing a document doesn't mean that the patient fully understands the risks. It may fulfill certain legal uh, check boxes, but uh, what's most important is that a patient uh, understands. I think it is something uh, sh that should be considered, uh, the radiation risk uh, uh, consent. In higher risk groups, I think uh, parents or children uh, should uh, who are getting a CT study, uh, pregnant women, you know, and also young adults with histories of multiple scans. At the very least, I think starting in those areas, I think having informed consent for someone in their 80s getting uh, restaging for metastatic cancer, uh, you know, I think uh, that's 
perhaps not necessary, but I think there we do know there are people who are at higher risk and over time. So I think, uh, you know, I think we should think about uh, doing at least for these high risk groups. Finally, I'd like to talk about the problem of cumulative risk and uh, whether we ought to disclose that. What I mean is, uh, you know, as you know, some patients have had numerous imaging studies, including CT studies, fluoroscopic studies uh, at an early age. And therefore, they've accumulated a considerable amount of aggregated risk from all those studies. It may well be, and I think there are a lot of patients who uh, don't have a good sense of just how much added cancer risk they've uh, acquired from all these imaging studies. So rather than, I think, uh, doing informed consent for patients before a study, I think it's probably more important that we disclose, if we're going to do one or the other, uh, disclose um, the, uh, the cumulative acquired risk to uh, these classes of patients. And this creates some additional challenges. First of all, the who's going to disclose? Let's say the patient's primary care provider has been tasked to do it. The primary care provider uh, may have only ordered, you know, one or a few of the many CTs the patient has gotten over their lives. Um, it may end up uh, getting to a point where one feels obligated and should not be obligated to explain the clinical decisions made by other people. Again, you know, we have uh, risk estimation tools that are imprecise. And I think, uh, although it's not like no evidence, I think, you know, the, the range of uh, risk, I think, uh, does, I think, should be thought about uh, before disclosing. And then there's a question of what can we do for patients after they've been exposed? Well, nothing really. Um, it's not like there's a therapy that uh, would lower their risk over time, um, specifically uh, from medical imaging uh, radiation. I do think it's uh, quite interesting how uh, occupational exposure and uh, exposure in the context of a clinical trial, uh, it's would be expected uh, that, uh, for instance, you know, radiologists, technologists exposed to radiation, their doses are monitored closely, and it's a federal mandate. Um, we expect to uh, disclose the fact that uh, a research subject is getting ionizing radiation, um, and that's uh, something that we do uh, inform consent. Uh, in addition to the other uh, components of the trial. So who should disclose this? Um, I do feel like we ought to be disclosing this. Uh, and I think it's probably the radiologist who should do it. Uh, and the reasons are because the radiologist may have a better sense of uh, the patient's imaging history in aggregate. Um, it's, I think, perhaps more easy to acquire. I think doing uh, rough dose estimates of all the studies could be uh, done, I think, uh, more easily from uh, the perspective or from a radiology department. Um, and they may be better positioned to gather information on, uh, you know, CTs, even ones that are not done at the institution uh, doing the disclosure. And I think we should start asking, um, offering this to select patients and uh, really start, start at the top and go down. So let's see on my talk, here are my references. And then now we'll go into uh, three of the questions. First question is, 
which is not an informed consent principle. So three of them are important components of informed consent, and one is not. So which one is not? Is it disclosing risks, disclosing benefits, C, discussing alternatives, or D, signing a document indicates that the patient understands? The answer is D. Just signing a document doesn't mean that a patient understands, of course. I think there have been studies that show that uh, mm. the majority of patients don't understand what they're signing in an informed consent. Second question, which statement is false? Is it A, that effective dose provides an accurate assessment of an individual's cancer risk from imaging? Is it B, that the leukemia risk in a child under five from a head CT is approximately two in 10,000? Or is it C, that comparing radiation risk from an imaging study to everyday activities may help put the risk in perspective? The answer, the false statement is A. Uh, effective dose does not provide a very accurate, precise estimate of an individual's cancer risk. It, uh, it's, it's a population-based uh, measure. Finally, which statement is not effective? Is it A? MRI does not impart any ionizing radiation, so it is completely safe. B, the dose from a CT study is akin to the annual dose from the environment. C, an important part of our practice is adopting newer technologies to lower imaging dose. Or D, we only recommend imaging when it is necessary. The ineffective statement is A. Even though MRI does not impart ionizing radiation, it doesn't mean it's completely safe. The patient may have an incompatible pacemaker, uh, so on and so forth. So thank you all for listening to my talk, and I guess we'll have a bit of time for additional questions at this time. Um. Thank you so much for that really interesting, comprehensive talk, and thank you for joining us live for Q and A's. Um, thank you. I have a bunch of questions that I'd like to relay to you. Um, okay, I'll try my best. I am between overnight well, shifts. So, I was super. Uh, <laughs> I was super interested that you are assigning the job of, and and you were very open in that there are different ways to do this, but that you're assigning the primary job of explaining the radiation and the risk to the ordering provider, but providing the, the radiologist the job of explaining the cumulative dose. So it's sort of, it's, it's sharing those jobs with the two different groups. And I'm wondering why that, why that split that the, I mean, I sort of understand the intensity of access to the full data maybe the radiologist has and, and maybe more understanding of the cumulative risk but why, why that split well uh for the first part i think when it comes to the study that's being ordered for the patient at this point in time the ordering provider knows uh the patient they've already established a more in-person uh relationship with the patient and uh, certainly can say more than the radiologist can often why they are ordering the study. The benefits of the study are much more, I think, uh, uh, better to articulated by the ordering provider. Uh, uh, because they're having that conversation, uh, I think the ordering provider can put things more holistically uh, in, in relation to, you know, uh, why we're doing the study and also the risks. So um, I, I think that is kind of why I would favor the referring provider talking. It also kind of simplifies steps uh, instead of trying to wait for a radiologist to show up or come, you know, it's so. Um, 
as far as cumulative risk for multiple studies goes, I think it's uh, mainly because uh, these patients probably have had many different people order studies for them over time. And so then, you know, who amongst uh, the these patients is surgeons, you know, maybe, you know, maybe a pediatrician when they were young, uh, ER physicians, uh, so who amongst them uh, should speak to it? And I think uh, I think in that case, most likely nobody has the full context of you know the imaging that was done. Uh, maybe if there's a patient who has had this one single provider who's followed them for decades and really has given you know has ordered the vast majority of the studies, they can speak. You know, but I think. In general, just given the fact that many people have had many providers, uh, I think that uh, puts a little bit too much of uh, uh, responsibility on them. Um, and uh, it's just, I think, you know, with the from the radiologist standpoint, you can sort of just see in packs and, you know, there may be uh, resources to help gather, you know, uh, actual amounts of dose uh, uh, from all these studies, uh, and then uh, speak to that. So, the, so the information is, I think, in general, uh, probably more accessible, and then you know, from that, the radi radiologist could speak to it. Um, that Super being said, helpful. you know, radiologists yeah, don't generally talk to patients very much uh, unless they're involved procedures. So that's another issue. But um, mm -hmm. I think uh, you know, you have to find the right radiologist for that. One of the questions sort of is a is a good next question for you to answer is that the ordering providers, but also the radiologists don't have visibility into a patient's cumulative effective dose. So they may have a large sliver, but not the entire pie of how many studies. So um, all that information doesn't currently make it into the chart. Do you have a framework for making? the cumulative effective dose more accessible to the providers, the radiologists? Do, do you think we should be collecting that information? Should it be in the patient's chart or somewhere else? Well, you know, I think uh, certainly with the Cures Act and in general, I think uh, the movements towards uh, patients having more of their clinical information, I think, uh, you know, I think that is the right direction uh, we ought to be going in terms of, uh, giving patients access to information and then you know so uh the dose information uh put into some context for the patient i think is also something that is reasonable to do uh, i think we have to do it carefully um you know like you said we most likely won't have you know the full uh you know amount that's been exposed uh if, you know to them so i think it's uh i think i think more than trying to give a precise number or percentage to patients uh i think it's more important to explain to them that this is you know this is something that uh is the case you know that this is uh they might not have told you, uh, but you know this is something that over time there's a risk that is not tiny, um, and uh, just from the ethical obligation, I think it's uh, you know the patients ought to know, um, and so we can again say you know it's going back to the slide about informed consent, even though we not necessarily know uh, to you know the perfect. Uh, information about the risk, uh, you know, it still doesn't mean we don't talk to them about it. So, um, so I think, I think, yeah. we, you know, I think it's something that we should have uh, more accessible to the patients, but I think we need to also kind of do it in a way that says, okay, here's the context. And also uh, try not to make patients too afraid of getting imaging. Again, all these imaging, you know, often is really necessary. And I think, um, uh, uh, so there's a bit of a balance there. I don't, you know, I think it, we could risk uh, frightening patients away from getting necessary imaging when they need it too. So, I mean, I think you do a very balanced job of sort of acknowledging there's risk. There's risk for everything we do in life or in medicine, and this is another risk. 
ask. I think there have been studies about whether patients make good decisions when they're informed about radiation. And those studies have suggested yeah. that patients do a pretty good job of making a pretty good decision. So if, if their child has been in trauma in the emergency room and the ED physician says you need this test, the parents say, okay. And if the test is really not indicated and they're given that same information, the parents then say, yeah, I think I'll skip it. So it, it's, it's not that every patient will make the same decision that you'll make because they get to make their own decisions. But in general, they make decisions kind of like we as the physician would recommend them to make. So they're able to basically handle the uncertainty if they're treated respectively, respect, respectfully and given the information. Um, someone asked um, sort of what, what you do in terms of communicating, you know, and another question in any model communication, do, do you have a template or something that you can use that's tailored to children or pregnant women or general patients that helps guide your communication? So, so what do you do? And then do you have any tools that you use that sort of help for particular groups to understand it? Sort of in a language as Don suggested to us as important, but sort of at the right level. Uh, to be frank, I uh, don't really do it as a part of my clinical practice. I work at, a, so I used to work at Brigham Women's and I work at Leahy and um, neither hospital has uh, really a pediatric component. So the, you'll see some kids come through uh, the ER, but it's, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, kids who have had some sort of injury and getting x-rays uh, usually. Um, so uh, as part of my practice, uh, you know, throughout my career, it's, uh, I don't really deal with pediatric patients in any sort of substantial way. Uh, pregnant patients also I think uh, it's uh, it's just quite rare to um, have it I think uh, you know we do certainly sometimes for instance uh, we'll do like a CT angiogram for a pregnant patient and uh, sometimes it does come up the question of uh, you know is it a, a nuclear medicine study or you know is a CT study is a higher you know dose um, and uh, in the past, yeah, that conversation I've had, but I think uh, it's still also quite rare and I, that I don't have, uh, actually, even though I present these things, I don't really have uh, anything that's sort of uh, so robustly developed uh, for me, uh, you know, clinical and perhaps I should. Um, you know, when it comes to talking with patients in general, I think it's uh, generally more uh, uh, the cases actually of pregnant patients getting an MRI or, um, the, you know, just discussing things with patients if they've had a, a you know, contrast infiltration into their arm for a, for a CT study of some sort like that. And uh, so um, a lot of this, I guess you could say is, a, you know, sort of more abstract from my end, but perhaps, uh, you know, perhaps I should, uh, you know, turn this into something more uh, I mean our, our our next speaker has has pointed out reminded us that you know patients do not have a good understanding of numeracy numerical information mm. and so suggesting that visual aids to show patients you know maybe dots for cancer patients and things like that would be useful I wonder if we could engage Dawn to help us develop tools like that that, that we can use uh, to, to basically help patients understand the risk without being frightened by it. Um, one of, I think our technologist has asked, which I think is a bit of a can of worms, but has asked, what is the cutoff point for a CT scan that's considered safe? And can the technologist tell the patient how much radiation they get for the study they have? How much total dose should be considered safe? And, and I would just add one small additional question to that. Um, which you said something about, uh, you, you know, uh, telling patients that um, we are doing the best to, you know, make sure they get the lowest dose possible. And that sort of hit some bells for me personally, because I don't think we're doing our best to keep the doses low. I see how that would be very comforting, but I don't think it's true. So 
you know, what, what, what are the doses that the technologist should have in their head for what's safe for a CT scan and can they communicate that to the patient? And can we say we're doing everything we can to keep the dose as low as as possible if, if maybe we're not doing that so much? Yeah, so I perhaps have a bit of a narrow worldview because uh, I trained at the Brigham and uh, now I was attending at the Brigham and uh, with Aaron Sodickson for many years. And so, you know, there, I think, you know, a lot of effort was made to really sort of get the doses low. Um, so uh, yes, I should not assume that the rest of the world is uh, doing those sorts of things. And that's quite right. As um, as far as uh, the threshold goes, you know, that I think is, kind of impossible to say. I think we should, instead of saying, okay, here's the dose, we should probably, okay, say like, what classes of patients should we be talking to these uh, more about? And then uh, regardless of, you know, the dose, um, I think maybe that makes it a little more simpler instead of trying to sort of figure out, well, is it, you know, does just meet this cutoff or not? Um, again, I think, you know, I don't really, uh, Practically speaking, I, I think it's, you know, for patients who are on cancer clinical trial and, you know, already, you know, in their 80s, and it's, it doesn't, uh, you know, I don't think there's real uh, strong convincing reasons for having these sorts of discussions given, you know, the rest of what's going on in their uh, lives and uh, medical care. But I think for, for children, for people who've, had, uh, you know, a threshold, for instance, you know, another threshold that we could consider is actually a threshold number of studies, uh, you know, calculated threshold dose above which then, you know, we should be having these conversations. Um, I think that maybe make it a little more simpler instead of trying to sort of decide, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, okay, this uh, three phase CT we should discuss rather than a uh, you know, single phase, uh, you know, CT mm -hmm. without contrast or kidney stones. Um, I personally think that I see no reason why technologists can't talk to these things with their patients. Um, you know, I think it's a, uh, you know, I, I do sometimes get calls from technologists, uh, you know, about one topic or another. And, uh, you know, I hear that's, uh, well, yeah, we're not really supposed to like kind of do this or that. Uh, I don't see why they can't do it. I mean, I think uh, uh, certainly if there's an interest in those technologists to have these stuff conversations, then that'd be great. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I think they're the ones who were at the machine and exactly. truth be told, have the greatest access both to the patient and to the information. So I think we need to empower them to be able to be comfortable providing this information. But I think all the better. I mean, you know, some technologists don't feel comfortable and, and, and if they don't have the right knowledge, of course they don't. But if we can educate them, I, I agree with you. I think they're a great, a great um, group to both comfort our patients and they're also the ones who advocate for using lower doses because they're seeing the patient. Um, I just want to add one thing. When, when Dr. Rahani told us yesterday that, you know, there are patients who are getting over 100 uh, millisieverts or milligray, that's not a small number. I mentioned that it, in the chat that it, in our registry, up to 1% of patients are getting that dose on a single CT scanning, meaning they're getting the four phases when Dr. Sodickson told us yesterday that they should be getting one from the ED. And so I think those are the patients who we have the greatest opportunity to lower the dose without lowering the diagnostic accuracy. So I think those patients are a real opportunity. Well, thank you again. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk and your work, and it was a pleasure to have you speak. Thank um, you for having me. Uh, I'm sorry I uh, didn't feel quite comfortable giving a 30-minute talk between my overnight shifts, so, but I'm happy <laughs> to be here. Understood, of course. Thanks for joining for the Q&A.